60,000 pilots who have flown in combat for the United States in four major wars. Only 1,400 of them have become aces, pilots with five or more victories in aerial combat. They are the best of the best. Some of them are famous, some are little known, but all made history and all of them have that special blend of guts, skill, and luck that separate the living from the dead by a razor's edge in the most dangerous job in the world. In the summer of 1972, Colonel Steve Ritchie became the only Air Force ace of the Vietnam War. Two of the victories that earned him that title happened on the 8th of July, when then Captain Ritchie and his radar intercept officer, Captain Charles de Bellevue, flying the two-seater F-4 Phantom, found themselves engaged in a low-altitude, high-speed missile-firing duel at knife-fighting distance with two enemy MiG-21s. And the worst of it was, Richie knew the MiGs were coming for them, but hadn't seen where they were yet. During the intense portion of the battle, when the enemy airplanes, the MiG fighters, had us in sight and we did not have them in sight, we had received a code which was heads up. And the heads up call meant that they had us in sight, they were cleared to fire, and at that time we did not have them in sight, and that information was at least 40 to 60 seconds old. So that's the kind of thing that really gets your attention. Uh, it makes you look around a lot more. Uh, I had rolled out on a heading of east, and I picked up uh, a radio call from way in the distance, 150 miles away, among all of the chatter that was going on. And this was um, an officer, an Air Force officer, in a radar airplane orbiting 150 miles away over Laos, looking at his radar scope. Uh, he was very familiar with the battle, knew what was happening, knew we were under attack. I had talked with him on the telephone that morning, he knew my name and my call sign and where we would be and what the mission was about. And instead of going through the formal radio procedure, which would have been something like this, uh, 
Our call sign was Paula, and he would have said, uh, Paula 01, this is Disco 23, you have blue bandits, a blue bandit is a MiG-21. You have blue bandits bearing 350 for two, come left to a heading of uh, uh, 290. Now, rather than saying that, which would have been too long, it would have been too late, uh, the MiGs would have probably been in a position to fire at us. He just said, Steve, they're two miles north of you. And I happened to hear it. And I made an immediate left turn to heading north and picked up a MiG-21 at 10 o'clock. Now, had I stayed on my easterly heading another few seconds, that MiG would have been right up our 6 o'clock, probably fired missiles at us, and we may not be telling this story today. I made this left turn to heading of north, picked up the MiG-21, coming in at 10 o'clock, continued to roll left, blew off external fuel tanks, went full afterburner, and we passed canopy to canopy, about 1,000 feet from each other, doing about 600 miles an hour each. Uh, the airplane was a spit-polished silver MiG-21 with bright red stars. We could see each other. I could see the enemy pilot in the cockpit. Uh, we passed very rapidly. An important point here is that I knew there were two MiGs and I didn't see number two. Now what they wanted us to do was turn on the first MiG, use the first MiG as bait, and sandwich us. They wanted us to turn on the first MiG, then the number two MiG would come in behind and shoot at us. Uh, that's something we would never do, by the way. We wouldn't sacrifice one of our own guys to get a shot at one of theirs. But they had no problem doing that. Anyway, I didn't see number two, so I stayed level, started to dive for the ground and waited. That's hard to do because that lead MiG is either turning to get on us or he's getting away. But I still knew there had to be two MiGs. There were two called and they were flying in pairs of two. And if they weren't in a, in a fighting wing formation, they typically were in trail. So sure enough, here comes number two, about 8,000 feet in trail. I was down below him now and it was hard for him to see me. As we passed, I went into a hard left turn expecting the MiGs to turn left. Well, instead they turned right, which was, a, a, I think, a critical mistake. About halfway through the turn, I picked up the number two MiG in a right turn level and high. Even though Richie had the MiG in sight now, he was still in a bad position to fight. So what I had to do was barrel roll, and I was able to come into a rear quarter position with the MiG high in the bright blue sky, and I was down low, a perfect position for a missile shot. I was able to get uh, two missiles off. They both worked perfectly. The MiG turned hard down into me to try to get away from the missiles and the first missile went through the center of the airplane and the second missile went through the fireball. That took 47 seconds. We were so close that uh, I flew over the top of the fireball, took a little piece of debris through the left wing, just a nice jolt on the stick, and got home and there was a piece out of the leading edge of the airplane. From there, uh, I was able to get what we call across the circle and get into position on the lead MiG. Now here, it's, it's, it's important to understand that we're in a three-dimensional fight, which is hard for most people to understand. Everything that we do on Earth is in two dimensions. In the air, one has to be able to think in three dimensions and upside down and what's happening all the time. And I didn't see the other MiG, but I knew from the geometry of the flight where I thought he had to be. And I maneuvered in that direction, and sure enough, there he was. I was able to get in position, fire two more missiles, uh, he was a lot better than his wingman. He turned a lot harder. And, uh, the lead missile of that second volley went through the center of the airplane. Um, and that was uh, 42 seconds from the, the prior missile hit. The total fight was a minute and 29 seconds. The skills and tactics that Colonel Ritchie and all fighter aces used all had their origins in the war that was supposed to end all wars. The airplane was barely 10 years old when World War I broke out in 1914. Airplanes were flimsy things made of paper and wood. The pilots sat in an open cockpit, usually right on top of the gas tank, and there were no parachutes. The first use of planes was as scout ships. Pilots in planes of opposing armies would pass by each other and wave or salute in polite neutrality. But it wasn't long before wartime hatreds spread to the air. Pilots began to fly above each other to try and drop bricks onto the plane below. Soon they were taking pot shots at each other with handguns, rifles, and eventually that other recent invention, the machine gun. Air combat was born. A system was soon invented enabling machine guns to fire between the blades of the propeller. 
Now pilots could aim their guns by aiming their planes. And maneuvering for position became a matter of life and death. Each plane would try and get on each other's tail, making ever tighter turns to do it. To observers on the ground, this maneuver looked like two dogs trying to nip each other's hind end. The term and the tactic of the dogfight was born. That was the situation when America entered the war in 1917, with an air force consisting of 35 pilots and 55 already obsolete planes. The most famous American ace of the war was a daredevil race car driver named Eddie Rickenbacker. He earned his wings in 17 days and in just three months scored 26 victories to become the top American ace of the war. Just a few days after Rickenbacker scored his last victory, the war ended. In four years, the basic tactical principles of air combat had been written in blood and fire. The first of those principles is that victory belongs to the sharp eye because most air combat victories are sneak attacks. To demonstrate the life and death role of position in air war, let's use racing cars because a fight between jets can take place over hundreds of miles. Most attacks come from behind. It's just like having a car come up behind you in your blind spot. The idea is to line up behind an enemy before shooting. That's because a plane is easier to hit if it's not moving across the field of view. This would be where most fights end, 80% of them as a matter of fact. Since 1914 to the present day, four out of five pilots shot down by other aircraft never knew what hit them. But if the fight doesn't end here, a struggle begins to gain the best shooting position. It's this maneuvering duel that most people picture when they think of fighter aces. A maneuvering duel begins with the break. A break is simply a hard turn into the direction of the attack. The idea is to turn so tight, the attacker overshoots you and winds up in front. The role of attacker and victim can be exchanged in an instant. The scissors is usually the maneuver that comes next. This is a series of turn reversals whose object is to force the other plane out in front and into the gun sights. Timing is everything, and the longer this goes on, the more chance there is of another plane getting on your tail and you're back to the element of surprise again. For a pair of aircraft, the sandwich qualifies as the oldest trick in the book. This is when two planes try to bait an enemy plane into attacking the first. Then the trailing plane sandwiches the enemy in between. This is what the two MiG-21s tried to do to Steve Ritchie. But war in the air is fought in three dimensions against rapidly moving targets. Attack may come from above and below as well as behind. It's the addition of the third dimension that enables a plane to do things that defy logic in a two-dimensional world. With a flick of the controls, turns can be reversed or square corners made at the speed of sound. All maneuvering of aircraft is a symphony of physics, constantly trading in the twin currencies of air combat, speed, and altitude. There are a host of maneuvers and variations, but all are about gaining that one deadly moment position.
the, the fighter pilot of today has to almost be like a, a computer. His mind has to begin to act like a computer because there's a tremendous amount of information coming in over the air, coming from the information from the cockpit, from the other airplanes, from the airborne uh, airplanes that are providing information. And the mind has to sort that information very quickly. Some of it has to be discarded and not used. Some of it has to be stored and used at different intervals in the future. And some of it has to be acted upon immediately. All in a three-dimensional sphere. You have to do it when you're upside down, on your back, under very high-stress, high-G situation. You've got to be able to think in that arena and know what you're doing and where you are, where your wingmen are, and where the enemy is and what they're doing, and where they're going to be 10 seconds from now, and where you're going to be 10 seconds from now, and what you have to do to defeat their position. The next stage in the evolution of fighter tactics was the Second World War. The planes were metal now, faster, but air war was still pilot against pilot, and plane against plane. And in the Pacific, that plane was the Lockheed P-38 Lightning. Designed by the genius American aircraft designer, Kelly Johnson, the P-38 had a top speed of over 400 miles an hour. It was in the P-38 that America's ace of aces, Richard Ira Bond, won 40 victories to become the highest scoring American ace of all time in all wars. Armed with four 50 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon in its nose, the P-38 shot down more Japanese aircraft than any other plane. And it was the P-38 that was to exact a very personal revenge for the attack on Pearl Harbor. mastermind of that attack was Japan's most skilled admiral, the Soroku Yamamoto. The Navy had broken the Japanese code and in April of 1943 learned that Admiral Yamamoto would be flying to the island of Bougainville on an inspection tour of Japanese forces. So the decision was made to intercept and assassinate the Japanese master tactician. It was to be a mission requiring split-second timing and pinpoint navigation to lead a squadron of P-38s 435 miles over open ocean to make the interception. Major John Mitchell was assigned command of the attack. The Navy, being the Navy, uh, had decided that, uh, that what we ought to do was try to get him in the boat as he was going over from uh, Bougainville over to the little island just off the coast there where they had uh, another installation that the Japanese did. I didn't want to do that because uh, I didn't know one boat from another and uh, they said he'd be in a submarine tender or something but uh, I, I held out for getting him in the air. I knew that if we got him, shot him down in the air that he probably in all probability would be dead. So we left the briefing room uh, with the exact time that uh, Yamamoto was going to land. Uh, I had to, of course, back our time up and uh, back Yamamoto's time up a little bit because I didn't want to catch him right over Kahili where they had about 75 fighters there uh, waiting. And uh, I wanted to intercept him uh, about 35 or 40 miles up the coast from the direction that he was coming. Ground crews worked feverishly throughout the night to ready the planes for their long-range mission. went up at 50 feet off the water all the way up, some 420 miles from takeoff to till we got to the interception point. We maintained radio silence all the way. No one spoke a word until we, uh, until we got there. It was in the morning, uh, around 9 o'clock, we left at 9. Uh, the sun, when I made my last turn into the uh, island, to Bougainville, uh, the sun was in my eyes to, uh, mostly, and it was a hazy morning and it was very difficult to uh, pick up land. I looked at my watch uh, for the umpteenth time since we had taken off, and I saw that I was about one minute ahead, and I'd been quite concerned that I hadn't made landfall, 
uh, knowing that I was supposed to be there at that time. Well, uh, it, it loomed up, the island loomed up just at that time. And also, my number three man in the flight uh, called out and says, uh, bogey, 11 o'clock high. Uh, so I looked up and I saw uh, two bombers. Uh, we thought there'd only be one, but there were two bombers. But we also were told that there'd be six zeros escorting. I looked behind the two bombers and there were three zeros there and back behind them there were three more zeros. So I was quite sure that we had the target that we were after. It was just, it was a perfect interception. I mean, it couldn't, you couldn't have no way that you could have planned it any better. There was something, some greater force than, than just my uh, compass and, and watch there that helped me make this interception. There's no question about that. With the enemy in sight now, Mitchell led his squadron in for the kill. So I turned parallel with them and started climbing. They were about 4,500 feet. We were still on the deck. As we climbed up to that altitude, we got just about even with them. Uh, I called uh, Tom Lanfear, who was the four-ship attack, uh, leading the four-ship attack section, as pre-planned the night before. And I said, okay, Tom, is your meat. And so Tom said, Roger, I got him. And he started in. And as they were coming in, the, uh, the zeros then peeled off and came down. And Lanfear saw him coming down. He peeled up into the uh, zeros and made a claim of shooting down uh, one of the zeros on that path. Uh, the bomber stayed with the, the two bombers. And then they split up, the bomber split, and he stayed with the lead bomber. And I'm sure they had everything to the firewall trying to get away. When all this was going on, I had climbed on up to about 16,000 feet as planned the night before, because we were expecting uh, at least half of these 75 fighters that were on this strip where Yamamoto was gonna land, uh, we were expecting them to uh, come up. And uh, I thought we were gonna have a hell of a rat race up there. Barbara stayed with the lead bomber and uh, pursued him all the way down to the ground and probably uh, maybe 100 feet off the ground, shot him down, set him, set him on fire, had to have crash and burn. When they did an autopsy on his body, they found that he had been shot, uh, two bullets had entered his body, one on his left shoulder and had lodged in his right chest and the other one went in behind his left ear and out his right eye. That, that's the actual official Japanese uh, autopsy on, on, on the animal. It, it was a, a well-planned mission. It was uh, a, a lucky mission. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of luck uh, of being on time. I didn't know what the weather was going to be. I didn't know what the winds were going to be. And it was a question of, of just by guess and by God that, you know, that we made it. The loss of one of Japan's great strategists was a turning point in the Pacific War. In Europe, the role of the fighter pilot was just as decisive. The bomber crews called them the little friends. And that's just what the fighter pilots and their aircraft were to the bombers whose task it was to destroy German industry. But not until the arrival of the P-51 Mustang in late 1943 did the bombers have an escort truly the equal of the great German fighters. Here was a plane that had it all. Long range, great maneuverability, and a top speed of 450 miles an hour. A young captain named Doc Watson became an ace in a P-51 during one of the bloodiest battles of the air war in Europe. The struggle to destroy Nazi oil production centered around Budapest. Because the area was so strategic, it was one of the most heavily defended targets in all of Europe. And in the midst of one of these massive air battles, Watson's guns jammed. But that didn't prevent him from escorting a crippled Allied fighter back to safety. Well, in September 1944, our Mustang group was escorting a group of B-24 bombers to Budapest. And we became involved with a tremendous fight, an aerial fight the likes of which I'd never been, never seen before. I guess a uh, hundred or more 109s, 190s, and P-51s in the sky at one time in this tremendous dogfight. And I lost my wingman because he had to turn off to protect himself. And when I turned around to help him, another 109 came in on my tail. So we got into a tremendous 
dog fight. He went into a big loop. At the top of the loop, I happened to catch him square in my gun sights. He must not have been more than 20 yards away. I pressed the trigger and immediately he blew up. I rolled out into a Emmelman to one side to avoid the wreckage. And there I sat behind another 109. Just couldn't have been more than 20 or 30 yards away. Well, chances like this come once in a lifetime where you're shooting down two airplanes in 10 seconds. But this was not to be because when I pressed the trigger again, all my guns were jammed because I had fired in a negative G configuration at the top of the loop. And when that happened, all my guns jammed. I thought, I can't do anything good here. I might as well go home. So I started to roll over and go down. And when I started down, I saw another Mustang heading toward the Adriatic. With smoke coming out of the side and obviously in bad battle damage. So I realized that he was a setting duck for any of the 109s that might spot him. And maybe I could help him, despite the fact I had no guns which I could fire. So I came down alongside of him and uh, made a signal like so. And he gave me one back, very happy, very happy. And uh, his radio had also been shot out, so we couldn't talk. But I went into a line of breast uh, formation alongside of him so that theoretically we could protect each other, although he was in no shape to protect anybody. It wasn't but a few seconds after that that two 109s came diving down on our tail. And of course, I immediately wheeled my Mustang around to face him head on. With his guns dead, Watson charged head first into the oncoming enemy aircraft. When I did this, I could see the flashes of the gunfire coming from the 109s. I could see that some of the hits on the airplane I was escorting. I was coming at them head on, so they broke off and turned away and dived back up to come down again. This went on a couple of times, and uh, finally, for one reason or other, they broke off and left us. Meanwhile, my friend in the Mustang is flying his airplane as well as he can, but losing altitude gradually. A lot of smoke is starting to come out of the engine, and the pieces are not flying off, but they look like they might at any time. We got near the Adriatic, and uh, sure enough, instead of smoke, we started to see a little fire. Just as he got to the water, the flames really started coming out. And I got a, real close to him, went like this, get out, get out. And uh, he bailed out immediately and started floating down to the water below. And his airplane blew up and crashed not far away. So I had called the Air Sea Rescue to uh, come and pick him up at this designated point. And sure enough, uh, a few minutes later, I spot these two aircraft in the sky, and I think, well, here are more Germans. But there were two Spitfires who had come to escort the Air Sea Rescue airplane to pick up the pilot. I had to go on home and leave uh, my friend with the Spitfires because I was getting low on fuel, and so I went on back to the base. I never found out who the pilot was. Never saw him in my life again. And somehow or another, in those days, you don't really think about that. The important thing was, we got him home and he lived. In the closing days of World War II, Allied bomber crews were attacked by a strange new aircraft, one without any propellers. It was the world's first operational jet the German ME-262 with a speed of over 500 miles an hour. The war ended before the Nazis could put their new wonder weapon to effective use. But from now on, 
there would be a new sound in the sky. The next war was to be fought near the speed of sound. The North Koreans invading the South in 1950 were flying the Russian-built MiG-15. A new jet was hurriedly deployed to meet the MiG challenge. It began the design process looking very much like the planes of World War II. But it was soon discovered that sweeping the wings back greatly improved aircraft performance at high speed. And this change was incorporated into the design of a fighter that came to be known as the F-86 Sabre Jet. The F-86 and the MiG-15 were roughly matched. The difference in the air war in Korea was between the pilots. Major Ralph Parr was one of only 11 pilots in the Korean War who became double aces, 10 or more kills. His first two happened in a classic encounter. By the time he pulled out of a screaming dive in his F-86, four MiGs turned out to be 16, and Major Parr was alone, locked in a 600 mile an hour maneuvering duel 100 feet above the treetops of Korea. We turned around and started flying southbound on the yellow at about 41,000 feet, and I glanced down and spotted a few flickering motions down very low across the ground. I called them, and Al Cox, who was my element lead, said, I don't have them. Go ahead, take it, and I've got you covered. I rolled over and went into a, just a regular split S. He saw me start to roll over and rolled up and waited for me to come across. I guess I was going full throttle, airplane clean, going straight down, just hanging on the straps, straight down as possible, as fast as I could go. And meanwhile, Al Cox had said, I lost you. Which way did you go? And I said, uh, Al, I went straight down. I pulled out, using as much G as necessary, which nearly over g the aircraft, at about uh, 100 feet off the ground. I was flying at a terrific rate of speed. I was, I was beyond the, the limiting mock on the aircraft. I looked up ahead, and pretty soon I picked up what I saw was a flight of four MiGs. And I was gaining rapidly from dead astern. So I figured, that's all right, there's four aircraft. Whoops, and there's another four airplane planes flying right next to them. And I thought, well, I've got eight of them cornered down here. That's all right with me. Uh, as I closed in, continuing, I picked out the lead aircraft. I figured the smartest guy in that flight was going to be up front. And rather than take an Indian sitting in the back that didn't know what he was doing half the time, I'd, I'd be better off uh, really notching the guy in the front and turn the Indian loose on me. About that time, I noticed another eight aircraft, and I figured, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. And they spotted me. Uh, they, they broke just like uh, feeding a banana into the back end of a high-speed fan. They just went in all directions except now. I stayed with the leader. The leader broke up into about a 70-degree, slightly climbing turn to the right. I pulled in as, as many Gs as I, as, as I could to stay on him and pull the trigger. And at that time, I found out later I had about nine and a half Gs on the aircraft. When I pulled the trigger, the uh, electrical motors on the, on the ammo feed belts for the aircraft uh, will not feed ammo uh, at more than eight Gs, and the, the gun started to stop. I got off the trigger instantly before they jammed, and uh, as a result, I was still able to fire. However, the, the high G load, and in trying to track the lead aircraft, it blew the fuse on my gun sight, so I had no gun sight. All I had was closeness to the, to the lead aircraft and I pulled up I pulled up alongside of him and went into a rolling duel canopy to canopy uh, I was looking straight up at the uh, at the MiG pilot and he was looking straight down at me except we were we were going in a rolling like this canopy to canopy I could see his feet on the floor I'm sure he could see mine I don't know how long we did it but we went around several times that way and all of a sudden just the flicker of a heartbeat I recognized the fact that I had, I had achieved a slight deceleration on his aircraft, and I thought, ha, that really cost you, friend. And uh, I cross-controlled everything, slid in behind him. I slid in so close, I thought I was going to hit his tail with my nose. In fact, I was listening for the, for the metal, and uh, I don't know how close it was. It's a matter of inches, but I, I did slide in behind his tail. As soon as I hit his wash, it popped me back several feet. 
and then I went full power on the aircraft, cleaned, cleaned up my dive brakes and everything else. I got a burst in on the on the lead aircraft. Uh, I couldn't miss him. I was it was point blank. I was holding the gun against his head, so to speak. Uh, windshield was was filled up with tail pipe. When I pulled the trigger, the aircraft immediately stalled from the tight turn we were in. The vibrations of the gun would stall the aircraft out. The aircraft mushed on through, and I had to fight to get back into position again. The MiG was absorbing a lot of punishment, but wouldn't go down. We went around, and I'd work my way back up, hit him again, and I'd stall out again, and get back. Well, about the fourth time I hit him, I I got a tremendous blast of uh, jet fuel all over the aircraft, across the canopy. Uh, I was awfully glad I stalled when I pulled the trigger because most of it did not go down my intake and, and feed extra fuel to my engine. I worked my way back up into position again, leaned the guns up against him again, pulled the trigger one more time. This time he burst into flame. The flame came back, went around and over the canopy, left little tendrils of soot all over the top half of my aircraft. From the nose, the canopy, the windshield, even even all the way around the tail, and they were still there when I got back to the field. Uh, I suddenly realized that cornering 16 by myself wasn't really the smartest thing in the world to do. But I could shoot at anybody, and they had to watch out for themselves. And uh, they had to identify whoever they were going to shoot at. And they also had to make sure they didn't run into each other down there. Al called me again, he said. And I, all he got an answer was, don't bother me, I'm busy. I thought, oh my God, I better look behind me and see if any of them have gained an advantage. And there was five MiGs sitting back there, all tracking inside me, uh, closing on me. And I went into a tight turn thinking, I've got $1,232 in the bank. I'd give every cent of it right now if I had a set of slats on this thing so I could turn tighter. I was getting a maximum turn out of the airplane. Uh, adrenaline was replacing blood like, like it was passing through a filter. Everything was going into slow motion. Uh, I looked back, I could hear the first aircraft when it opened fire on me. The, the cannon shells, it, they looked, we were pulling so many G's in the turn. And remember, we're still down in less than 500 feet. You, sort of working between 100 and about 500 feet. I could distinguish individual leaves on trees. So we were quite low. And uh, he was not hitting me. Uh, I could see his cannon shells rolling out of the barrel and going down just like peas out of an inert pea shooter. And uh, all, all three guns of his were hammering. I, I heard the, the second aircraft open up over the top of the first aircraft. I heard the third aircraft over the top of the first two, and they were all firing. No less than seven MiGs literally emptied their guns at par as he lured yet another enemy jet into position. I finally forced him into a position where I thought he was going to try and ram me. And before he rammed me, he dipped his wing into my jet wash, incredibly close, but still missing. When he hit the wash, it pitched him back out, pitched around, took a snapshot at him, and he went in and, and hit the ground immediately and burst into a, just a flying blast of flame from the ground. Reversed back again and picked up another fellow coming in on me and uh, sucked him in a little bit closer. Uh, in fact, I had to back off a little bit to keep to encourage him to get in close because I wasn't going to be any good at long range shooting without a gun sight. And as soon as he broke, I waited for him. I rolled over the top, got in the approximate area that he was, pulled the trigger, held it down, and walked my tracers through him. I got a number of strikes on him, and I thought, well, I better hold off and look around some more. I glanced back, and the rest of the aircraft were coming in on me. This time, Cox had come screaming across the top. And, uh, he told me later when we got back that there were so many airplanes down there that eight of them had pulled up to cover the fight, and the other eight had stayed down there with me. And when they saw him coming in, they knew we didn't travel in anything less than fours. And so they alerted each other, and they all took off immediately. And I was about willing for that myself, because I was damn near out of fuel. 200 miles from home and uh, had 900 pounds to, to make it on, and I was on the deck. When they confirmed the fact that I did get two confirmed kills and one damage, uh, the squadron commander walked in and uh, made the comment. He says, okay, he says, if you're gonna, if you're gonna cut airplanes out of the sky like that, why, that's the last time you fly wing, I need shooters up front. Ralph 
Akbar's encounter is a classic example of the fighter ace's aggressive spirit. What enables a pilot to leap into a fight against such overwhelming odds? It's a question every combat pilot has to confront. Doc Watson. We had 50 airplanes at one time in our squadron, in our group, and we were down to seven. Some of us felt that uh, there'd probably be a time coming when we wouldn't come back. Even though I desperately wanted to go home to my family, my mother, and sisters and brothers, I felt that I had to do this because you couldn't fly combat and think about home and your loved ones and how precious your life was back in the States, the land of the great chocolate mall. So uh, I had made my peace with God and I had decided that I would uh, give it my best, but I was ready to die if I had to. And uh, I had reached that stage where I uh, knew that I probably would. And I felt uh, when I escorted this pilot back without any guns and without any capability of defending himself that he too wanted to get home and he too wanted to live but there was a job to do and I was there to do it and thank God I was able to so what is this special state of mind World War II ace captain Robert DeHaven some would call it bravery I think that is nonsense some would call it foolhardy, I think equally that's nonsense. It is simply and a characteristic of most fighter aces that you're able to assess a situation in context with your own self and capabilities and to exploit that situation to your advantage. The stress of high-speed combat creates an altered state of consciousness. It's, it's sort of funny, uh, surrealistically, uh, that uh, when you are under a tremendous, tremendous amount of pressure and uh, things are going very fast and there's a hell of a lot at stake, that you get so much adrenaline pumping through your system, your mind starts traveling at a rate of speed whereby everything seems to go into a very slow motion. You, you can almost anticipate everything. As a matter of fact, uh, when I turned around and looked at that MiG point blank firing at me, I started, for no reason in the world, counting the rivets uh, on the upper inside of these ducts. And I got back to 17 before he overshot. I don't know how fast I was counting, but I remember the number 17. I just counted 17 rivets on the upper inside of these air ducts. But humans can't operate in this altered state for long without paying a price. It's probably the most intense pressure that one could ever have. I remember coming home from that mission on the 8th of July and having uh, probably the worst headache of my life. And it had to be from just the incredible pressure of that few, few minutes. Flying a fighter airplane is as challenging, as exciting, as demanding as any job that there can be. It's as dangerous as any job that there is. When you add the combat element, it presents the ultimate challenge. Uh, it takes a certain spirit, a certain uh, type of person that is willing to risk, uh, that is adventuresome, uh, that is aggressive. Uh, however, there's a point that one has to, has to know. There's a fine edge. Uh, boots blessé in Korea coined the term, no guts, no glory. Too much guts, no glory. If you go beyond that point of your ability or the ability of your airplane or the ability of your team, you probably lose. That's a fine edge. It's that edge that pilots seek to sharpen by constant training, but which can only be truly forged in the ultimate fire of combat. Only then will a pilot discover if he possesses that special blend of skills to become a fighter ace.